Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that will have taken place in our country over the past week or so. And the Guyana is a place of action. In any given week, there are a number of important issues worthy of our discussions. I want to begin by welcoming our viewers who are joining us on television from Region 5, West Coast, Barbies. Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And across the Barbies River, I want to welcome all of you who are joining me on television along the east bank of the Barbies River, New Amsterdam, Kanji, and of course, along the quarantine coast. Good evening. Welcome to our viewers and listeners who are joining us from Freedom Radio, from Rob Street, Georgetown. Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And last but not least, to the thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live across Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, Asia, and further afield. Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. Please share this program so that all your friends and your followers can join in tonight's important discussion. Please share this program. Press that share button on your phone, on your computer, on your iPad, or whatever instrument or device you're using to view this program. Share it so that all your friends and all your followers can join in tonight's discussion. Mohani Danisar, Sally Jones, Ramsaran at Waru, Patricia Singh, Tularam Moralidar, Stanley Ramsaran, Soma Bipat, Harris Delani, Kelawan Singh, Beki Kumar, and so many of you from across Guyana and across the globe have joined us already. Welcome to another program of issues in the news and continue to share this live so that as many of your friends and followers can join us in tonight's discussion. I had a great event in Queens, New York at the Fairfield Pavilion and 101 Avenue and I want to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of that event. I want to thank those who attended that event and I want to thank so many of you who joined us on live stream. So the past week or more, we have spent a tremendous amount of time on this Venezuela-Guyana border controversy, and rightfully so. It is one of the most fundamental challenges that Guyana has faced since its birth as a nation state on the 26th of May, 1966. And all of its citizens and all of its leaders have rallied together, have joined hands, and have presented a united front in defense of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of our country. As a government, we organized a large number of public engagements, speaking engagements at various schools, at various public fora, um, on live stream uh, discussion engagements, at symposia, and at different intervention, so as to educate our people, most importantly, on the historical evolution of this matter, the case claimed by Venezuela, and how their claim evolved and the nature and purport of that claim, the processes that we have embarked upon and completed in our efforts to resolve this difference by peaceful and lawful means, and our current sojourn at the International Court of Justice in our effort 
to bring the a resolution to this matter we believe that in fact we are of the firm view that our case is one that is invincible and venezuela's case is hopeless for that reason perhaps more than any other the world is on the side of guyana every major organization in the western hemisphere have signaled their support for and have expressed their solidarity with guyana these include the united nations the commonwealth the organization of american states caricom and independent big countries such as the united kingdom the united states organizations such as the european union and many individual territories have come out publicly and expressed their support for guyana and have called upon venezuela to respect the rule of law to respect international law and to respect the orders and processes of the international court of justice from all indications the referendum which president maduro conducted last monday the 3rd of december from all the international reports the independent international press reports that we have received and that are on the internet tend to suggest that the referendum was rigged that the referendum backfired on maduro that the people of venezuela did not support the referendum that the numbers disclosed by the maduro administration as votes cast in favor of the referendum are fraudulent and falsified numbers and that and there are images showing the large polling stations across venezuela being empty on polling day all of that tend to suggest that the referendum was an abject failure the person who is who has assumed the role or is described as the opposition leader is on public record voicing a similar opinion nevertheless president maduro in his usual bravado has said that the venezuelan government will move to the sixth step we don't know what that means but the international court of justice has issued a clear prohibition against venezuela taking any steps whatsoever to interfere with or enter upon that piece of land called esequibo which the court has found as a preliminary finding is under the administration and control of the cooperative republic of guyana and that guyana has a plausible case at a prima facie level sufficient enough and strong enough for the court to issue orders to protect this current status quo until the hearing and determination of the merits of the case 
And that is where the state of play is. As I've said every time I spoke on this matter since the ruling has been handed down, the court in its ruling emphasized on several occasions throughout that ruling that the ruling is binding on Venezuela and on Guyana. There is no question on the side of Guyana that we do not consider the court's ruling binding. We have submitted to the court, we initiated the proceedings before the court. I believe those sentiments were directed specifically to Venezuela and the court also made it emphatically clear on two or more occasions throughout its judgment that Venezuela is subject to the court's jurisdiction. Those are powerful and emphatic sentiments that the court made during the course of its ruling. And I believe the court did so consciously and intentionally. Because if there is any breach of the court's admonition, edict, and orders, then I believe that the court is ready to take enforcement measures to ensure compliance with its orders. And the question on everyone's mind has been, what are those enforcement measures that are available to the court. I have said repeatedly that any court that is incapable of enforcing its own judgment, even if it is the magistrate's court of a state, the lowest court in a state, once the court doesn't have the ability to enforce its own order, that court will lose its majesty. It will lose its awe. It will lose its ability to command the respect of those who come before it. If you translate that to the International Court of Justice, which stands at the summit of the international judicial hierarchical structure, then you will obviously be able to conclude that a court sitting at that high level cannot afford, in today's world in particular, to allow its orders to be ignored without consequences. This is not an ordinary initiated process. This process before the court was initiated upon the recommendation of the General Secretary of the United Nations. And that complicates the matter for Venezuela even more. Why? Because it's not only the International Court of Justice whose integrity and standing will be on trial if its orders are not obeyed, but it's the United Nation itself as the preeminent global regulatory body in today's world that will also be on the trial if an order of its principal arm is violated with indignity and with impunity. More so since that it is the Secretary General of that organization that recommended the matter to the International Court of Justice. 
For those reasons alone, I believe that no breach or violation of the court's order will be condoned or tolerated in any form or fashion. But I want to leave with you a couple of points that I have accumulated for your benefit in relation to judgments of the ICG. And this is what the international literature says on the matter. Judgments delivered by the court, meaning the International Court of Justice in disputes between states are binding upon the parties concerned, are binding upon the parties concerned. And the court made that very clear in its ruling. Article 94 of the United Nations Charter provides, and I quote, each member of the United Nations undertakes to comply with the decision of the court in any case to which it is a party, unquote. So the decisions of the ICG are binding and final on the states, on state parties to the case, and are not subject to appeal. So they can't appeal any order. It's binding and it's final on the parties. And when the court pronounces on a particular matter, because it's a decision of that court that can be appealed nowhere else, that decision becomes part and parcel of international law. The decision itself becomes part and parcel of that body of law known as international law. One legal foundation for the bindingness and enforceability of international judicial decision is the principle of pacta sunda servanda, which requires states to fulfill their international obligations in good faith. The principle is a fundamental principle of international law, and it applies to international judicial decisions, including those of the ICG. States are obligated to comply with ICG decisions in good faith, and failure to do so can have implications for their international reputation and legitimacy. Mechanisms for enforcing ICJ decisions. Now, this is a question that is on the minds of a lot of people. What are the mechanisms to enforce the ICJ decisions? So if Venezuela fails to comply or violates the decision of the ICJ, what are the mechanisms for enforcement? And this is what the mechanisms are, some of them. Enforcing ICJ decisions is a critical component of the effectiveness and legitimacy of the international legal system. Let me make this point again. Enforcing ICJ decision is a critical component to the effectiveness and legitimacy of the international legal system. And that's the point I was making earlier. If you violate the court decision, or if the court fails to enforce its own decision, it is undermining the legitimacy of the international legal system. And that will not be tolerated in today's world. One mechanism for enforcing, I, let me skip that because that's not so relevant at this point in time. The main arm of enforcement of decisions of the ICJ is the United Nations Security Council. A state which considers that the other side has failed to perform the obligations incumbent upon it under a judgment rendered by the court may bring the matter before the United Nations Security Council. So, Guyana, if Venezuela doesn't comply, is free to bring the matter 
to the, to the United Nations Security Council, which is empowered to recommend or decide upon measures to be taken to give effect to the judgment. The UNSC has the power at the request of the injured state to take special measures to enforce judgments rendered by the ICJ. And Article 94.2 of the Charter makes that abundantly clear. The Security Council has the authority to enforce ICJ decisions and it can take a range of measures to ensure compliance, including economic sanctions, travel restrictions, and the use of military force. And the court, the UN Security Council has done that in many cases. I can give you two, the oil platform case and the Corfu Channel case, where the United Nations Security Council enforced the ICJ judgments in, those, in these two cases. The political costs of non-compliance have to be taken into account by potentially recalcitrant states. Article 41 of the Charter provides for non-military enforcement and Article 42 provides for military enforcement actions. Let me read Article 41 for you. So you have two range, two ranges of actions that the United Nations Security Council can resort to in enforcing orders of the ICG. Military and non-military. Let's deal with the non-military force. That is expressed in Article 41 of the Charter. It reads as follows. The Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to its decisions and it may call upon the members of the UN to apply such measures. These may include complete or partial interruption of economic relations and of rail, sea, air, postal, telegraphic, radio, and other means of communication and the severance of diplomatic relations, unquote. Those are the wide range of non-military sanctions that the UN Security Council can call on its members members of the United Nations to take. And most of the world, over 250 odd countries, are members of the United Nations. So when one state becomes recalcitrant, it can face the sanctions of over 250 states. That will mean doom for any recalcitrant state. Some countries have not been able to recover for 70 years from sanctions imposed by one other country. Imagine 250 odd countries imposing sanctions on one country. Decisions of the Security Council taken under Article 41 on measures not involving the use of armed forces, such as to apply economic sanctions are binding for member states called upon. So when the UN Security Council calls upon member states to impose these sanctions, that call of the United Nations Security Council becomes binding on the states called upon. They now are bound, they don't have a discretion, they are bound to carry out and execute those sanctions. Then Article 42 provides, should the Security Council, and I quote, should the Security Council consider that measures provided for in Article 41 would be inadequate or have proved to be inadequate, it may take such action by air, sea, or land forces 
it may take such action by air, sea, or land forces as may be necessary to maintain or restore international peace and security. Such action may include demonstrations, blockade, and other operations by air, sea, or land forces of members of the United Nations. This is the military type reaction where the non-military type sanctions have failed or have proven to be inadequate. I thought that I would leave that. I can go on to deal with more, but I believe that I should leave that with you because many of you are asking those questions. The International Court of Justice is not a toothless poodle and it will not be rendered by Venezuela as perfunctory and sterile. I do not believe that will, uh, it will allow its processes to be trampled upon, denigrated, undermined, and subverted by Venezuela. After all, Venezuela is still before that court and the case is still ongoing. Any attempt by Venezuela to annex or to invade would be to defeat the case that is before the court, to derail the court's jurisdiction, to render that which is before the court otios and nugatory. And the court has issued these provisional measures to protect the integrity of its own process. And that is why I am saying that if Venezuela is to dare act in a manner contrary to what the court has ordered, then it is not merely the breach of a court order. It is the subversion of the court's process. It is a subversion of the UN process because the court is sitting based upon a UN recommendation. It's not Guyana going by itself and instituting these proceedings. So those are fundamental characteristics that are inherent in this case that make it almost impossible for Venezuela to act in a reckless manner. Unless, of course, they have, they have lost rationality completely. Significantly, I believe that the people of Venezuela, the army of Venezuela, have recognized the folly of what Maduro is inviting them to do. And that is why I believe by their absence and by their refusal to vote, they are sending a clear signal to Mr. Maduro. They are not prepared to travel this path. After all, they are reeling under sanctions already. The nation is in disintegration. They are leaving the country by the thousands per day. There is starvation. There is a breakdown of social services in the country. The people are facing the brunt of that. If, they are to, if more sanctions are to be imposed, they will be facing the brunt of the suffering and suffering that will flow therefrom. And that is why I believe they have demonstrated good sense and have withheld their participation from this fanciful gimmick of a referendum executed by President Maduro and his government. This 
engagement or these engagements that our government is currently executing will not stop because the referendum is completed, but that doesn't mean that the problem will disappear. We have to continue to be vigilant.